Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 6. Um, let's read through the first eight verses, and then uh, we'll get into the message. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for this time together in your word. It is living, it's powerful, and may that sharp two-edged sword pierce our hearts, our minds with your truth. Uh, Lord, may, may we stand upon uh, the promises of your word. And Lord, we need the whole counsel of your word, not just pick and choose things we like, but Lord, we thank you for uh, Genesis to Revelation, Lord, that your word is sure, it's uh, relevant, it's powerful, it is life-changing, and we thank you that your Holy Spirit is the one who takes your word and transforms our lives. And so we pray that you continue to mold us and shape us into the men and women that you want us to be. And we just commit this time to you now, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, Acts chapter 6, verse 1 says, Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. We'll talk about them in a moment, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, who we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. So in chapter 6, we see that the, the church is experiencing growing pains at this time. Uh, we saw in chapter 2, it says that the Lord was adding daily those who were being saved. In chapter 5, we saw that the Lord was subtracting those who needed to be removed from the church. Remember Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, Jesus says that he came to bring division. And here we see that the Lord is multiplying. And so God is behind it all. And God is a great mathematician. I'm not so smart when it comes to math, but I like God's arithmetic. The growth that uh, there came brought added problems to the church. And so, yes, there were problems with the first century church. A lot of people like to idealize the first century church. Oh, they were great. They were perfect. They were walking in the power of the Spirit. God did all these amazing things, which he did. But he still does amazing things, and the church is still far from perfect, and it wasn't perfect back then. Uh, the twelve apostles, we'll see, were becoming overwhelmed. They were trying to do everything in the church, and as a result, they were starting to neglect the most important things that God called them to do, which was prayer and ministry in the Word. Now, that does not mean or suggest that other ministries are not important, or other ministries are less important, because... Every ministry in the church is important, but it's simply a matter of prioritizing what God has called each one of us to do. Did you get anything? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's fine. Came in in their hunting gear, and it's like, oh, could have brought some elk steaks to the barbecue or baptism. Oh, well. Anyway, but it's simply a matter of prioritizing what God has called us to do, to be faithful in the place the Holy Spirit has placed us. Whatever we do for the Lord and for the church needs to be done in the power of the Lord. It has to be done as unto the Lord. And it goes back to having a servant's heart. Jesus says, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, be the servant of all. We need to learn to be servants. I mean, that's first and foremost. Jesus said it best. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. 
Jesus says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. And that servant's heart is what characterized Jesus' ministry. He was constantly other-centered and not self-centered. He was reaching out to others, ministering to others. He was always looking for opportunities to bless others around him. And so when we're filled with the Spirit, when we're walking even as Jesus walked, we won't see any ministry as too small. We won't see any ministry as too unimportant. We'll see Jesus and we'll see opportunities to serve him as we serve others. And so here in chapter 6, as the church is growing and needs are changing, we have the apostles coming to the conclusion, we can't do it all. We need help. We need people to step in and step up. And this is really where we see body ministry start to unfold in this chapter, Acts chapter 6. So once again, look at verse 6, or chapter 6, verse 1. It says, now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, again, probably around this time, they're only three months old after Pentecost, and there's about twenty to 25,000 people in the church. That's quite a bit of multiplying. And so we see that there, the, the disciples was multiplying. There arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. First of all, we see... That grumbling and complaining within the church, again, it's nothing new. It happened from the very beginning. Here we have the Hellenists. Who were the Hellenists? Well, they were Greek-speaking Jewish believers in Christ. And they're complaining about the local Hebrew Christian believers that uh, the local Hebrew widows were being served and the Hellenists, the Greek-speaking Jewish believers, were not being served, the, the widows. And so they had a very legitimate complaint here. But how the, the apostles handled this was what kept it from becoming a very divisive issue in the church. Because let's face it, Satan would love nothing more than to divide the church. He's constantly trying to divide churches and divide families. Now we've already seen how Satan tried to attack and destroy the church from the outside. Uh, he was beating the apostles by the religious leaders. He was threatening the apostles, again, through the religious leaders, and they're telling them not to teach or preach about Jesus Christ. Obviously, that didn't work because they kept telling people about Jesus Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection, and their salvation in no one but Jesus. And so uh, Satan's next strategy is try to join up with them, come alongside of them. And that is one of his best methods of trying to overthrow and divide churches. Get the people's focus off of Jesus, Get the people's focus on everything but Jesus. Get them looking at all the specks in everybody else's eyes and not realizing they have a beam coming out of their own eye. And so we need to be very careful. And if our focus stays off of Jesus for any length of time, division quickly follows. Now again, there's no such thing as a problem-free church. Neither is there such thing as a problem-free marriage. But what we're going to see in all these things is that we need to have the Holy Spirit producing all the fruit of the Spirit within our lives if we want to see a healthy church and a healthy family, a healthy marriage. Love, joy, peace. We all say, oh yeah, we all want more love, more joy, more peace. Well, what about patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, you know? All these things are important. Self-control. Without these things, then it's going to be tension, it's going to be conflict, there's going to be, like we see here, division in the body. So look at verse 2, it says, um, well anyway, no, before I look at verse 2, whether it's in our church or in our homes, we need a love for Jesus first and foremost, we need a love for His Word, we need a desire to serve others. And that's, that's always a solid foundation upon which to build our lives. Now, when it comes to widows, this became a big issue in the early church because there were some widows who weren't really widows. We would call them black widows. Uh, they were uh, doing things that weren't godly. They were doing things that weren't right. But they're saying, we want the church to bail us out. We're getting ourselves in all these problems, and we want the church to bail us out. So Paul steps up, he comes on the scene, and this is what he writes in 1 Timothy chapter 5, starting in verse 3. We've got quite a few verses here to look at. This is uh, Paul's instructions when it comes to widows. He says, honor widows who are really widows. 
Okay, if you're really a widow, this is good. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. Now she who is really a widow and left alone trusts in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. So this is a godly widow. But she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. And these things command that they may be blameless. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he is denied the faith. He is worse than an unbeliever. Some versions say worse than an infidel. And so what they were having problems with were, uh, you know, widows saying, okay, my husband just died. And I've got all these kids. They're all grown. They got their families, but I don't want to bother them. So I'm just going to go to the church. And he's like, no, 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 you go to your family first. The family, the children better step up. The grandchildren better step up. I'm saying this about my grandkids when I get old and feeble. They better step up. No, I mean, but that's the way it is. I mean, we want families to be with families growing together as they get older and need help. It's not to be pawned off on the church. It says, though, verse 8, but if anyone does not provide for his own, or that verse 9, do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number, and not unless she has been the wife of one man, well reported for good works, if she has brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work. In other words, this is a very godly woman. But refuse the younger widows, for when they have begun to grow wanton against Christ, they desire to marry, having condemnation because they have cast off their first faith. And besides, they learn to be idle, wandering from, about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things which they ought not. This is why Paul gets in a lot of trouble with women, by the way. Therefore, I desire that the younger widows marry, bear children, manage the house, give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some have already turned aside after Satan. If any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them. In other words, again, the family takes care of the family. And do not let the church be burdened, that it may relieve those who are really widows. And so the church is not to neglect real widows, but those who have family members, hey, get back into a right relationship with your family and learn to grow together as a family. Okay, back here in Acts 6, look at verse 2. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Now, again, the primary function of the church is to feed the flock. We feed the flock by teaching the word of God. We do that from in here, the sanctuary, all the way through high school, middle school, on down to the toddlers. They need to be founded upon the truth of God's word. They need to be built upon the truth of God's word. They need to learn how to become dependent upon Jesus and not dependent upon the church, not dependent upon me as a pastor. You know, we're not doing what God called us to do if we're getting so caught up in everything else that's going on around us. Philippians 4.19 is for all of us, where Paul says, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And so we want people to have a desire for getting really close to Jesus. And then in turn, as they get close to Jesus, Jesus will start working in their lives and you will start to reach out to others and you'll want to be used by him to help others and help others learn more about Jesus. Remember when Jesus was restoring Peter after Peter denied the Lord three times, you know, three times he says, do you love me, Peter? And he says, yes, Lord, you know, I love you. What did he tell him? Feed my sheep, you know, tend my sheep, feed my lambs. How do we do that? Primarily through the Word of God. That's how we feed the flock. Not through social programs, not by meeting everybody's physical and material needs that they think they need and want. Jesus said, if you really love me, feed my sheep. In other words, Peter is my apostle. Your top priority must be teaching the Word of God. Don't worry about all the other stuff because I will raise up a bunch of godly men and women who will do the other stuff. And so it's not being inferior or superior, it's not lesser or greater, it's all of us have different roles and responsibilities in the church. The apostles was, feed my sheep. The apostle Paul quickly learned this in Ephesians chapter 4, 
verses 11 and 12, Paul writes, And he himself, that's God, the Lord, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, and here's the reason why, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying or building up of the body of Christ. So how is the body of Christ built up, edified, equipped? Again, by teaching the word of God in such a way that people become more dependent upon Jesus and less dependent upon me or others, but we can become more dependent on Jesus. It must break God's heart to see his children becoming dependent upon a pastor or a church rather than on his son, Jesus Christ, because only Jesus can set you free. Only Jesus has paid the price in full for your sins. Only he can deliver you from the domain of darkness and bring you into the beloved son's kingdom. Only Jesus paid that price for our salvation. Only he has promised us and given us eternal life. And so why do we look to others when we need to be looking to him first and foremost? Yes, he can use others, but don't look to others to meet your needs that only God can meet. Our faith only grows by feeding upon the Word of God, not by listening to sermons who belong to the Sermon of the Month Club. That's not a joke. There's many Sermon of the Month Clubs out there. Rick Warren was the main guy that started this. He had over 100, this is 25 years ago, he had over 100,000 pastors regurgitating his messages. He had 30 people working on his messages. It wasn't even his message. He had 30 hired people. Let's put this together in such a way that people, you know, they get their ears tickled. They feel good when they go out the door and they just feel like, oh, Jesus loves me. doesn't matter what I do. And it's just fluff. And it's sad. And I got a big packet from Rick Warren. I gave it over to Roger Oakland, who I think used it in a book, one of his books, because it was just like, this is ridiculous. You don't need to be anything but a talking head. Have a good charisma, a good personality, uh, speak good and then you can just be part of the Sermon of the Month Club. But it's not by listening to preachers who do little more than promote themselves or hold themselves as the ideal role model for God. No, it's all about Jesus. And so the 12 apostles, they look at the problems and they say, it's not desirable that we should leave the Word of God and serve tables. Now again, they're not being snooty about this. They're not you know, going around saying, wait on tables, serve tables, serve widows, we're above that. No. That was not their attitude at all. It was a matter of spiritual priorities. They needed to be careful not to become so distracted that they neglect the Word of God. You can become so distracted in ministry that everything else you know, takes place of what God has called you to do. And that's true for every one of us in here. If God's put something in your heart to do, then you do it as unto the Lord, and you don't let everything else around you distract you from what God's called you to do, because Satan loves to get us distracted. And then the body starts doing different things. You know, the finger says, I want to go this way. The nose says, I don't want to be part of this. I want to go my own way. And pretty soon the body gets divided. So when pastors try to be everything for everybody, first of all, we can't. Eventually, the top priorities of prayer and Bible study begin to suffer, and I've seen it many years. I mean, this is our 35th year as Calvary Chapel here, and I started the church 35 years ago from home fellowship, and I've seen so many young pastors come and go out of this valley. It's really sad because so many of them burn out. The first year is the honeymoon period, and I've talked to a lot of young pastors over the years about this. Everybody loves you. You're the new guy. Second year, it's okay. By the third year, they're putting all these demands on you, and they want you to be everything to everybody, and they want you to study 24 hours a day, pray 24 hours a day, and then meet everybody after you pray and study for 24 hours a day and do everything for them. And then they burn out, and within three or four years, you see guys moving on or quitting the ministry. It's not a healthy thing. So the thing we need to do is make sure that we don't burn out. We need to make sure that we give a healthy diet to the congregation. And really, the more people who are serving, the better. And that's been one of the greatest blessings for me as a pastor here, is just seeing so many people step up and serve in different areas of ministry. That's the body of Christ. Once again, serving tables is not inferior to what the apostles are doing. It simply was just not their job. Now, there's nothing that God you know, asks you to do that is inferior. If God puts something in your heart to do, that's the most important thing. That's the greatest thing you can do. There, there's no inferior thing to that. There's no superior thing to that. It's all a privilege and a high calling, but it's very important to be faithful to the calling that God has given you.
Be content in the calling God has placed before you. Uh, Peter writes, make your call and election sure. So whatever it is he's called you to do, you're going to receive the same rewards as Paul and Peter, Billy Graham, Chuck Smith, anybody. Because what you do as unto the Lord, whatever it's, he calls you to do, he'll reward you for that. Not for trying to be something that you're not. Many people wrongly use their ministry as a stepping stone to what they think is a superior ministry. But that shows a lack of understanding about the beauty and the function of the body of Christ. Because as we're serving others, we're serving the Lord. I mean, read Psalm 75. That's where we see that promotion comes from the Lord. You know, you look, you know, you look at uh, James 4.10. This is on the screen. It says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. You know, God tells Zechariah, this we need to tell Zerubbabel, Zechariah 4, 6. So he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, not by your own strength, your own ability, nor by power, that even means collective power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. When Jesus was teaching the apostles about service, he said, you've been faithful in the smaller things. I will give you, uh, make you ruler over many things. And so be faithful in the little things. But whatever you do, it's for the glory of God. And, and you look at it as a wonderful privilege from the Lord because none of us are worthy. None of us are worthy. I mean, I'm not worthy to be up here. You know, you're not worthy to be whatever you're doing as unto the Lord. It's a beautiful calling that he puts upon our hearts. Now, look at uh, verse 3. He said, this is their solution. Okay, there's a problem here. You know, these widows feel neglected. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Notice, these are the qualifications the apostles wanted to see in these seven men who were waiting on tables. Okay, that's not a great you know, position. You might think, well, waiting on tables, you know, I'm above that. No, these were to have good reputation. Notice these three things. That means they were to have a consistent walk with Jesus, both in fellowship with other believers, and out there when they're working in the world. They were to have a good reputation. Ask yourself, do I have a good reputation? Do I have a consistent walk with Jesus, both in the church and in my home, or on the job? Christian businessmen should have the best reputation in town. Honesty and integrity and being a man or woman of your word is very, very important. I hear this far too often from people in our church. Well, I called this business, and they said they were Christian. They had a fish in their ad, and now they're charging me double what they quoted. I've had that happen recently, and I'm like, that's horrible. I mean, we should have a good reputation. Honesty, integrity, being a man or woman of your word. When the dirty jokes start you know, coming out, then you should get out of that situation. A verbal agreement or a handshake should be good, as good as any document you write. If you're a Christian, if you're a person of your word. Secondly, it says that the Lord's servant should be full of the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine that? They had to be filled with the Holy Spirit just to wait tables going around cleaning the tables, going around bringing food out to the widows, going around, and well, we'll see more of what they did here in a moment. But they were to be full of the Holy Spirit. God wanted them to be joyful. He didn't want them to be cast down. He didn't want them to be joyless and defeated, working among the people. He doesn't want that for people working in our nursery or working with the toddlers or greeting he wants you filled with the Holy Spirit. He wants you filled with love and joy as you minister to those that he brings here. God doesn't want you know, immoral people, men and women on the worship team, leading people in praise. He wants them filled with the Holy Spirit so that they can emanate his love, his goodness, his grace, his peace, self-control as they are leading us in worship to a holy God. 
You know, serving the Lord should be a joyous privilege and an honor. And, you know, there's nothing worse than having a visitor come to our church and they see a bunch of disgruntled, discouraged, depressing people standing around saying, life stinks. And by the way, your kid's in my Sunday school class. No, you don't want that. We need to make sure that we consistently go before the Lord, spend time in His Word. That's from behind the pulpit. That's for all of us. Spend time in His Word, allow the rivers of living water to wash us clean, fill us up so that we can serve in His power with His love so that we can you know, walk in the power of His strength and not in the weakness of our sinful flesh. Again, that's desire, God's desire for all of us. Not just for a select few, but for everybody. Now, not only were they to be full of the Holy Spirit, notice the third thing here. He says, choose seven men who had wisdom, men who make wise choices, men who choose the ways of the Lord rather than the ways of the world. I mean, we need to walk in wisdom. Proverbs 9, verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And so these were the basic qualifications that the apostles were looking for. A good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, and wisdom. Again, these are traits that we should desire for each and every one of our lives. Look at verse 4. But, the apostles are saying, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. Again, that's their top priority for serving the people of God. Be in prayer, be in the Word, and that is the order it needs to be in. Prayer first, then the Word. Make it a point to speak to God about people first before you speak to people about God. Does that make sense? That didn't mean the apostles didn't do anything else in ministry. Pastor Chuck was a great example of this. You know, he was often, you know, if you heard, oh, there's a you know, backed up toilet. He would grab the plunger and, you know, there could be 2,500 people in the sanctuary. He'd grab the plunger and go clean out the toilet if it needed to be done. So nothing is beneath us. It's just top priorities are the Word of God and prayer. Now, uh, those were the two main things, and they need to be careful not to get distracted by everything else. Again, the Word of God is a lamp to our feet. The Word of God is a light to our path. The Word of God is living. It's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. The Word of God blesses us. The Word of God nourishes us. The Word of God counsels us. The Word of God always points us to Jesus. Look at verse 5. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. Well, right there is a great miracle. When was the last time you heard somebody say, this is what we're going to do, and everybody's like, yeah! It's like, no, we're going to grumble and complain about it over lunch. We're going to have roast pasta for lunch. I know. I've heard. But it says the whole saying here, it pleased the whole multitude. And they chose, notice again, Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon or Timon. I don't think it really matters. Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. So a couple of things to note here. All the guys they picked were Greek-speaking Jewish believers. Who had the complaint? The Greek-speaking Jewish widows and believers. And so they got their fair representation. They got seven of their own people who are going to oversee this matter. But the final decision here was up to the apostles. Notice it says they were set before the apostles. They prayed. And basically like, Lord, if you have picked them, then you need to confirm it. And we'll just lay hands on those that you have brought forth. You know, God is one who anoints people for ministry. It's not men who anoint people for ministry. All we are to do is recognize God's hand is on this person. We see this, and so we encourage that person, go for it. And that's for a lot of you in here. You know, I don't need to be, you know, micromanaging everything people do. If you're using your gifts and talents for God's glory, praise the Lord. We see a good example of this in Acts 13, verse 2. It says these guys were gathered together as they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Spirit said, now separate to me. Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. 
And when they had fasted and prayed, it says they laid hands on them and, and they sent them on their first missionary journey. Now, again, look at these guys. The first two names mentioned here, Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, and Philip. They started off as table waiters. Again, not a, you know, we would think, oh, that's no big deal. But they did what they did as unto the Lord. And God would raise them up, and they would do greater things in ministry. In fact, Stephen in verse 8, it says, did great signs and wonders among the people. Stephen, in chapter 7, will preach one of the greatest sermons in the Bible. The simple table waiter was faithful in the little things, and God brought the increase. There was a man there named Saul of Tarsus. Later, he'd become the Apostle Paul, who was you know, listening to Stephen. And then he voted, yes, let's kill him. That was Saul of Tarsus. He ends up using... Stephen's outline for most of his sermons that he gives. And so God used Stephen in a powerful way. And then when we get to chapter 8, I'll talk a little bit about this guy at the baptism. We see Philip. Philip was raised up from being a table waiter. He becomes a powerful evangelist. He will lead many of the Samaritans to faith in the Lord. He will be the one that leads the Ethiopian eunuch to the Lord, and that eunuch will take the gospel to Ethiopia, and God would use tremendous things in their lives. But again, they started off serving food, wiping down tables, maybe unseen by the people, but they were noticed by God, and God called them to do greater things. Again, be faithful in the little things, and God will bring the increase. I mean, that's how it was true in my life and with Elizabeth. When we got married, even before we got married, we were dating and then we're engaged and we're in San Diego. We served in children's ministry there for a number of years. We, you know, did youth ministry and I, you know, hooked up with one of my good friends, Gary Lott, and we did youth ministry together for a few years there in El Cajon, California, and then, you know, moved here and didn't know what I, I mean, I wasn't trying to be a pastor, but we started up a Bible study and I started doing a Bible study at work, started doing a Bible study in our home. People start showing up, and next thing you know, God starts doing, you know, bigger, greater things. You know, it's just part of being faithful in the little things He's called you to do and let God take you the direction He wants you to go. Notice the result, verse 7. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Now, here's an interesting phrase, the last part of verse 7. And a great many of the priests, these would be the Jewish priests, were obedient to the faith. Uh, again, a beautiful verse. The apostles were freed up to do their ministry. The word of God spread. The gospel went forth. Many people are getting saved. And then... They weren't satisfied to just go to church. They wanted to be used. They wanted to be touched by the Holy Spirit, used by God. And so they were taking the Word of God. They are changing people's lives around them. But it was because the Word of God spread. It wasn't charismania. It wasn't some fanaticism. But God's living Word was going forth in power and in love and in truth and was not returning void, even as God tells us in His Word. The Word of God, it was piercing people's hearts with conviction of sin, the need of repentance, because it's the Holy Spirit who came into this world to convict the world of sin, repent, and judgment, and, and righteousness. And, and so the Holy Spirit's moving as the Word of God is going forth, and people are repenting of their sins, and they see their need for Jesus. Again, the second part of that verse, verse 7 a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now, a lot of people just read right over that, and it's like, oh, okay, that's cool. These would be the Jewish priests that served in the temple and around the temple. There were hundreds and hundreds of priests, especially during the three feast days, or three feasts. You know, Passover was one of the main feasts, and as these men were working on Passover... These priests were the ones that were taking the animals the people were bringing in. And during Passover week, Josephus says, and it's around the same time, 250,000 sheep were slaughtered there on the Temple Mount. And their blood was poured into bowls. The priests were using these, take it to the high priest. He would do with the, the blood what he was going to do with it. But there were 250,000 sheep, you know, serving here. Um, it was just an amazing time. 
And those 250,000 sheep, all that blood just temporarily covered people's sins. So what happened on that Passover when Jesus was the final Passover lamb? Well, again, hundreds and hundreds of priests would be working during this time. They would be sweaty. They would be hot. They're, they're slicing. Well, I hate to go into too much detail, but, you know, they'd slice the neck of the lamb. They'd pour out the blood. And there were actually troughs they found, these gutters coming off the Temple Mount. It dropped down to the Kidron Valley, the brook Kidron. Why is it called Kidron? Because it means black. The water would turn black. The sides of the hill would turn black because of all the blood of the animals that were coming off the Temple Mount during that time. It was just an amazing time. But then on that final Passover day, something amazing and unexplainable happened. At 3 o'clock on that Friday afternoon, the, these priests, they're frantically working away in and around the temple, sacrificing the lambs. Just a short distance away was Calvary, Golgotha. Jesus hanging on the cross. And at exactly 3 o'clock in the afternoon, that's when Jesus cried out, It is finished. The way of salvation is complete. Jesus yields up his spirit. And immediately, when Jesus died, this is what we read in Matthew 27, verse 51. Then behold, the veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. Now, that's quite an event. Right at 3 o'clock, the veil in the temple. You know, you've heard me talk about this before, but in Herod's temple, the temple that was still there at that time, the, the veil was 80 feet high, and it was about 6 inches thick. It's not just a little curtain you go rip. It ripped from top to bottom. No human being can rip this from top to bottom. It was God himself when Jesus died and gave up his spirit. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. That veil's ripped from top to bottom. Can you imagine the sound that would have made an 80-foot high curtain, th six inches thick, ripping apart? And these guys were all working around the temple. They heard something, and all of a sudden, at the same time, there's an earthquake. And then rocks are split. And these guys are probably going, what in the world's going on here? And so these guys would just be blown away at this event. Now, God, when he tears that veil apart, we're told in Hebrews that the veil represented the body of Christ. And so when it was torn, it pictures Jesus giving up his body, the, his body being torn as he's dying on the cross, meaning that entrance into the presence of God is now available to everybody. That veil in the temple separated sinful man from holy God. Only the high priest once a year could go in behind the veil and, and put the blood on the mercy seat. But now that veil is torn. God's saying, everyone is now available to come a uh, have access to me, I'm making myself available to all of you. If you come to Jesus, you can have access to my presence. And this is what God says to all of us as believers, Hebrews 4.16. Let us therefore come boldly, that means confidently, to the throne of God's grace, His grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so what an awesome thing to experience when Jesus died on the cross. These priests heard it. They felt it. Oh, yeah, and by the way, there was darkness over the whole land for three hours. And so these guys, they've experienced a lot. And they hear this, the earthquake and everything else. And then, you know, Peter and John, as soon as the Pentecost comes, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. They're going around telling everybody what this means. Yeah, the temple was torn in two. In fact, later on, these uh, leaders in Israel, they, they sewed up the temple veil. They, they sewed the veil back up. That was a tragedy. Jesus tore it apart so you can have access to God. But these guys, these priests, are hearing the good news. They're hearing about Jesus. They're, they're hearing as John and Peter and the other apostles are going around telling them, you got to repent, you got to turn to Christ. He loves you. He died on the cross for your sins. That's why you heard these things on Temple Mount, priests. And, and all of a sudden you have access to God. But it's all through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And so a great many of the priests 
give their lives to Jesus, received him as their, you know, Lord and Savior. And again, I'm sure these guys had a great testimony, especially the ones that were on the Temple Mount when all that happened. Now, beginning in verse 8, we're going to stop with verse 8, but from verse 8 through chapter 7, it's all about Stephen. And the focus is on this gifted servant named Stephen. Just look at this verse real quickly, though. It says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. I find this verse awesome for a couple of reasons, because here's this guy, Stephen, full of faith, full of power, because he was full of the Holy Spirit, and God used him in tremendous ways, and it says he did great signs and wonders among the people. What does that look like? I don't know. It doesn't tell us what he did, but great signs and wonders among the people. And this is important because there's a lot of people out there that say, well, God only worked through the apostles. And once the apostles died off, then there were no more miracles. There were no more healings. There was no more, you know, these great signs and wonders. Well, here's a table waiter named Stephen, a diaconos, deacon. And God used him in tremendous ways. When you're sold out to Jesus, God can do awesome things in and through your life. If we just make ourselves available to Christ, if we just say, Lord, here I am, use me, fill me. I just want to be a servant of yours. Then God can do amazing things in us and through us if our motives are right, if our motives are pure. And again, there's no limit to what God can do in your life. Stephen is a beautiful example of this. You know, he probably went about his little ministry with a smile on his face. So you got widows, they have children. So I'm sure as he's waiting on the tables, he's just like, hey, can I pray with you? I see you're really hurting. Your husband just passed away. You know, I can see your kids are really struggling with this. Can I pray for you? And so he starts praying for them, and they, and they see the joy in his life. And, and as he's praying for them, you know, maybe there's some of these kids, they fell, they break an arm, and he pray, I don't know, but I'm not a doctor, but I'll pray, and then they're healed. I mean, who knows? What are amazing signs and wonders? I don't know. Don't limit what God can do. But here, he's looking for opportunities. How can I minister to these people who are hurting, who are struggling? And so he's interacting with the children. He's interacting with these widows face to face. And as he grew in his faith, God must have given him wonderful opportunities just to pray and be used by God to do amazing things. Nobody knows for sure. It just simply says that this humble servant did great wonders and signs among the people. Do you want God to use you in a powerful way? Then let the Holy Spirit clean up your life. Be a person of a good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, saying, here I am, am Lord, use me. Make wise choices in your life, and God will bless you. He will use you beyond anything you could imagine. But you need to come to that place where you make a choice to separate yourself from the dead deeds of the flesh. You set yourself apart for God's exclusive purposes, and you say, God, I need you to wash me clean. I want to be a vessel of honor for your glory. I humble myself before you, I repent, I yield myself to you, and Lord, I just pray your will be done in my life. And if you're truly sincere about that, you will see God do amazing things in and through your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these amazing examples of these seven humble servants. We call them table waiters. Lord, so many of us have done things that we thought, well, this is just very simple, very basic. But Lord, if we serve you in the flesh, there's nothing good that's going to come out of that. But if we humble ourselves and say, Lord, here I am, use me for your glory, then God can use us in amazing ways in our workplaces where we can be light and salt to those around us, in our neighborhoods, in our families, first and foremost, where we can be vessels of honor for your glory, where we truly love one another with the love of Jesus, where we allow the Holy Spirit to produce good fruit in all of our lives. Lord, when we stand before you, may we all hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. 
Enter into the joy of your Lord. And it doesn't matter what we're doing, what kind of job we have, what we do in retirement, as long as whatever we're doing, it's for the glory of God. And so, Lord, we thank you, and we just want to commit our ways to you. We pray for the baptism this afternoon, that those being baptized would truly be blessed and encouraged as they step up and as they um, are not ashamed to be identified with Jesus as their Lord, as their Savior. Lord, we pray it would be a special time in all those who are being baptized and those who are witnessing. Lord, may we uh, just have a joyful, grateful heart for the work that you're doing in all their lives. And Lord, continue to use us as vessels of honor for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.